Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. And uh, those of you who are listening outside, or maybe uh, we hear some of you are listening at your homes on radio, and so we welcome all of you this morning to worship and to just being together as a community as more and more of us gather inside the building, the new rules. The rules have changed again. Um, we, we're having a wonderful rule-bound life, but it's, it's slowly loosening up. So we are allowed to have as many people as we can fit in so long as uh, outside of our family circles we can have the proper distancing. So we're thankful for that. It certainly gives more opportunity for us to gather together. A number of announcements. Uh, most of you will have already received a phone call from your elder uh, noting that Shellard Calder passed away this past week. And so the family has left flowers here to which they say we're so thankful for Shellard's life and we give thanks to God for the gift of life that Shellard was to us. And of course, we feel the same way, what a gift he was to our community. So we pray for the greater Calder family and especially the Udals, um, Shelley, Andrew, and the three boys who of course journeyed very closely with Shellard over the last number of days. I also lost a beloved aunt this past week in Holland, and so I want to remember my aunt Ina and her family as they grieve her loss and uh, ourselves as well. And also the sad news that Kim has been diagnosed with cancer over the last couple of weeks and will be undergoing surgery on Wednesday. So we want to pray for Kim and the Lord's healing and wisdom for doctors as they journey with her through different treatments. <clears throat> Great news is we are um, continuing to move forward with our anniversary celebrations. That'll be this Saturday. And um, we're praying for really great weather <clears throat> as we hope to be outside as, as things loosen up and there's just uh, some planning for walking down memory lane, but also an opportunity to just gather together. If you come, you, you get a nice little history book, um, very simply done, um, but gives a little bit of history of what's happened here at St. Paul's over the last 175 years, just a little memorabilia sort of thing. Uh, also just some, some drinks and some little eats. So we hope to have a good time with all of that. Continue to remind you that we would like to put together a pictorial directory for our 175th anniversary. We're hoping that'll come out sometime in the fall. So gather your families, take a photo, and send that in. Uh, you can either give it to me, you can email it to Carluke Presbyterian. Um, at gmail.com or whatever means uh, works best for you and we'll make sure that that gets pulled together. As we come to worship, we already have felt that call of God to come to his house and give him honor and praise. And from Psalm 33, we read, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all of the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, for he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. And in Deuteronomy we read, It is written, You shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The words of God, the word Christ, is our encouragement for each day. Let's come to our Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you, in a sense, very hungry. We hunger for answers to the things that are happening in life and the questions that we have. We hunger for reasons as to why. We hunger for want of healing in our bodies, our relationships, our hearts, our minds, 
We hunger for your comfort. We thirst, Lord, for normalcy. And as we come this morning, we wait on your spoken word to quench our thirst, to satisfy our hunger, knowing that you alone can bring that fullness into our lives. Father, we know that there are many areas in our life that are empty. Empty because we haven't done the things that you have desired us to do. Empty because we have filled our hearts with other things that are not of your love. Father, we confess those this morning. And we long that as we surrender them to you, you would fill us, feed us, quench us with your grace and with your love. As we enter into this time of worship, we say we love you and we give you our hearts. And Lord, we give you our lives that they may be used to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We begin by singing song number 500 in the hymn books and on the overhead, Open My Eyes That I May See, all three verses. As we enter that time of offering, it gives us a moment to pause and reflect those things that we offer our God. And especially in the summertime, when we go on our vacation, when we uh, mull about a little bit slower, hopefully, um, but also being able to visit with people a little more because of the weather, then we want to reflect on offering God our hearts, offering God our praise as we look to creation, offering God our, our lives, our hands, our feet, our lips as we journey with others, and especially uh, over the summertime when we meet up with others. Of course, we also want to think about all the things that are happening in the world, of which there are many sadnesses. If we think of flooding, fires, um, tornadoes, war, strife, all of these things need the word of God and need our offering in terms of prayer 
and also in terms of support. Of course, some of the ways that we do that is through our regular gifts as well here at St. Paul's. We do that through our Presbyterian sharing in which through a larger denomination that works with other uh, churches around the world, we're able to meet incredible need by um, or through our giving. So we want to remember those things. So encourage you to continue your givings. Also, our children's plate is remembering our homeless downtown, 541 Exchange and Eatery. Uh, as we give gifts to them, they put buttons in a jar, and those who don't have money are free to take as many buttons as they need, worth about $1 each. Uh, and get bagged lunches at this time since the restaurant isn't open. And it's been just a wonderful ministry, not only to feed them, but also to walk with those who are less fortunate and, and be an encouragement to them. And many are the volunteers who talk with them and walk beside them. So these are just wonderful offerings that we can give to our God. As we look to... Um, our message this morning. We're looking at the words of God and the word of God who is Christ. And so I begin by telling you a little story about an army of frogs. They call it an army. I always think it's hilarious. Have you ever, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but have you ever played those games, you know, where it's like, you know, what's a baby swan? It's a signet, you know, and it's a swarm of locusts and a flock of birds. Well, an army of frogs were hopping about. And two of them fell into a deep pit. And they tried with all their might to get out, but they couldn't. It was much too deep. And their other frog friends came and stood along the ledge of the pit. And they looked down and they realized there was nothing they could do to help them. And so they yelled down at the two frogs and said, you know, save your energy like it's, it's hopeless. There's nothing you can do. Make peace with whomever you need to make peace with and, and embrace your fate and die peacefully. Well, the two little frogs tried jumping for quite some time and, until they were exhausted. And the one listening to his friends above, exhausted, tired, realized there was no hope. And so he laid down and succumbed to his fate and he died. And so the other frogs around the ledge were yelling at the last one, say, you too should just surrender, be at peace and die. And wouldn't you know it, that, that frog aching, muscles in pain from trying to get out, tried one last time, gave it everything he got, and miracle upon miracles, he makes it out. And the other frogs gather around him and say, well, why is it that you tried when we told you not to? And the frog finally, out of the rim and being close enough to read their lips because he was deaf, said, I thought you were encouraging me. And that gave me everything I needed to come out. The power of words. They can be life-giving. They can not be life-giving. There is great power in the tongue. We turn this morning for our first scripture reading from James chapter 3, beginning with verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord, and another with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs. Neither can, salt, can a salt spring produce fresh water. Words speak powerfully, either of life and death. Words have the power to affect change for good and bad. 
Words have power to direct others toward hope and defeat. They can be weapons which destroy the will to keep trying or have the power to pull someone through. Words bring about redemption and destruction, cursing and praise. And James says, brothers and sisters, this should not be. Back in high school, I was doing terribly at math. And so the teacher suggested that maybe I come in for some extra help at lunchtime. No, and no kid likes to give up their lunch hour. And so I waited 20 minutes for the teacher to come. And finally, that teacher came and said, I don't have time for you, and left. Now, the words for a teenager stung pretty badly. And I'm sure, reflecting now, what he meant was, sorry, today doesn't work out. I don't have time. But what I heard was, you're not worth my time because you're a failure. And that stuck with me a long time. And I failed that math class. The next year, I had a different teacher. That teacher came alongside me, sat beside me at my desk, told me, I believe we can do this together. And I passed. How is it that we approach life situations? Do our words bring life to a particular struggle, problem, or conflict? When illness comes, when relationships crumble, when maybe the ghosts of the past persist, when anger flares, whatever, is verbal venting that we do just for the sake of venting? Or in our venting, are we seeking the healing and hope of Christ? And do our words reflect that? Do our words seek God's hand of redemption in all situations? You see, we can, we can get stuck with something that's happening that's bad, and we can just speak about how bad it is, or we can speak about how bad it is and then ask the question, but what is God doing in the midst of it? And where is God in the midst of it? Well, this is what David did as he wrote Psalm 40, and we're going to look at that text starting at verse 9. Here, David speaks of having been in a pit, much like the frogs. David was a man who, who experienced many pits, the pits of despair due to sin, a, a pit of hopelessness as King Saul sought many years um, to kill him, and he had to hide. And then again, David's in a pit when his own son comes and tries to dethrone dad, and again, he's running for his life. Here in Psalm 40, though, David doesn't just vent for the sake of venting, but he recalls the Lord's promises. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. Speak of your faithfulness and of your salvation and of your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. I do not, with, do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. Well, if we read the whole psalm, we hear a lot of David's struggle before he proclaims this testimony to God. And David here is trusting the word of the Lord, noting how in the midst of everything he waited patiently for the Lord. And if you think of that, running from Saul for some 14 years, that's, that's a lot of patience. You see, David's words could have said something like, Saul is a terrible king. There's nothing good in him. He needs to be dethroned. He should die. Or my son, Absalom, what a bad apple. What a rebellious kid. Should give up on him, make him a write-off. 
Or, God, I've done so many terrible things in my life. You couldn't possibly forgive me. David could have sat there. Such talk may well have driven David to despair, to hate, perhaps even killing. But hatred breeds hatred until the reasoning for hate grows stronger. And such action... Such breeding talk pushes out the redemption and promises of God so that we don't even hear it anymore. But David doesn't speak evil of his enemies. Rather, he puts the, words, Lord, uh, the Lord's word on his lips, declaring, I will never speak badly of Saul, for he is the Lord's anointed. I will never lay a hand on him or harm him. And he says the same thing about his son Absalom, who's out to kill him. Going into battle, he admonishes his fighting men, don't you lay a hand or harm the boy Absalom. David speaks not of vengeance, not of harm or death, but of hope, restoration, protection, life. And in the midst of all his hardship, David seeks and testifies to God's goodness. He does so by intentionally placing God's faithfulness, saving help and love in the center of every trial and hardship. I'm not saying that's easy to do. And we learned earlier this year that our venting sometimes is about lament to the Lord. And it's about coming to the Lord and placing the Lord in the middle of that. We want to consider this morning what of our words should not be. How might we strive intentionally toward language that brings redemptive hope to others in tough situations or even to ourselves? Perhaps you're the one down in the pit Or you know another who is. For those standing around the rim, what are your words? You've had a bad year, bad relationships, work is overwhelming, you feel offended, illness comes, you don't believe in yourself. Do your conversations, your thoughts about each of these things bring life or death? You see, there is some reality in the fact that we have much of, um, well, let, let me say it this way. Much of what we experience comes out of what we say. By that, I mean if we speak hopelessly, we will feel hopeless. Speaking of how bad the world is will only open our eyes to seeing all the bad. Fueling and feeding grumbling only makes it grow bigger. And so we might want to challenge ourselves. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see what it is that you are doing. Because sometimes what we say is what we get. People of God... Be encouraged, though, that we have a new language that shapes reality, our worldview, and our actions when we share the language of Christ's hope. We find a peace that passes understanding in the midst of all of it. And that's that's more than a psychological mind over matter. You see, there, there was a time when I went to, it was kind of a makeup sales party, you know, if you've ever been part of those, and and their mantra was this, if you look good, you feel good. And if you feel good, you do good. And if you do good, you are good. Well, doesn't that sound like a nice philosophy? The words of Christ are much deeper. You see, there's not enough good that we can do to make us feel that good. That's psychology. And I want to say there's a place for psychology. There's a place for counseling and that kind of healing. Absolutely. But we've learned that we cannot redeem ourselves. 
that most of what we, what we do to be good, we, we fail at to some degree or another. And yet this morning, through James, through the words of David, we realize there's a spiritual mystery in the word Christ. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Through Christ's life, death, and resurrection that raises us from a destruction, a life of destruction, breathes truth, breathes redemption, breathes hope into everything. Because Christ has proclaimed that I have come to give you life and give it abundantly. The statement of Jesus comes after he talks about thieves that try to steer his sheep away from safety. The tongue can be like a thief, having the power to rob, steal, destroy. Confidence, hope, sour expressions can leave us exasperated, frustrated, terrified, feeling down. Yet the word Christ, the words he spoke, the words that he left us in scripture have the power to heal. And all of life's circumstances, even as we talk with others, need God's word of promise, assurance, and hope as we speak to and with each other. Such language has real power to bring life to dead situations. And when we, Holy Spirit-filled children of the risen Christ, live by the word, something is release. And hopelessness is met with hopefulness. So as we go out today, let us embrace what God as Lord has declared over our lives And make that the only thing that comes out of our mouths. Through his grace. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the word made flesh. And who came and lived among humanity. You showed us the power that words have to bring healing to enter into those places in our lives that are filled with fear, anxiety, worry, concern. Your words, meeting the disciples when they squabbled about who was better. Lord, your words bring healing. And you yourself are the healing word. We invite you now to heal us first with your words. That in a new and fresh way, those things that have been weighing us down, those things that have gotten stuck in our lives in which we only feel grumbling, where we only feel lament, where we only feel venting. Lord, bring your words of hope and healing. Bring your peace that passes understanding. Bring peace. And Lord, may we receive these words of hope and know that we have been redeemed, that we are your beloved children. And Father, as we receive this, as we embrace the redemption that we have received from you may we share that with others we recognize lord that in so many ways day by day we are helpless to control our tongues and so we surrender them to you this morning and to the leading of your holy spirit and fill our hearts and minds with your love And so, Lord, this morning we want to speak redemption and praise over those who are grieving. 
We pray for the Calder family. We pray for the Blunkenberg family, Lord, as, as they grieve and yet as they praise you. Because of the faithfulness, Shellard's was as your child, as your servant, and the assurance that he is with you as long as well as our aunt. We thank you, God, that we can experience your grace in these moments. And Lord, we speak life to cancer that is ravaging in members of this congregation. We continue to pray for Bob, for Grace. And Lord, we pray for Kim. May your healing hand come on them. And may your words of hope and hopefulness encourage them day by day. May their eyes turn to you and may we as your people encourage them every step of the way. Lord, we pray for rains, preferably without lightning, to come upon all the fires that are out west. We pray for those who have had to run and leave everything behind, their homes, much of their life. We ask, Lord, that they may experience your touch, your peace, And we pray that as they look ahead, that you would encourage them that they may be able to find new homes. We pray for violence in Afghanistan, and Lord, we recognize that there are times when all that is happening in the world, we just feel like we can't even care anymore. But we speak life to our human human siblings who are suffering, who are dying, and we pray for an end to violence. We pray for comfort. We pray for your peace. May your words wash over us this week in healing ways, and may we share those words of healing and the resurrected, abundant life that comes through Christ with others. We pray this In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing those words of life, hymn number 498. Stand. 
hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah. My word goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. I will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. People of God, go in the love of God the Father, the fellowship of Jesus Christ, and with the love of the Holy Spirit. Amen.